Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for, uh, these, for these stories and these words that you have written down for us today in the year 2015, dear Lord. For centuries and for, for thousands of years, dear God, you've, um, you've given us your word and we love it and we love you for it, dear God. We pray that you would please just open up our understandings tonight. God, grant us more wisdom and more knowledge. And um, help me as, a, as the pastor, as a preacher, dear Lord, to preach this message and to do so in all honesty and truthfulness, dear Lord, and that you would just move my spirit and help me to preach boldly. God, um, help our minds to be free from distraction. Help us to be able to just to, to come together and listen and hear what it is you would have us to learn tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 22. If you remember last week, we, in Genesis chapter 21, we just, just recap a little bit. Um, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, and um, you know Abraham had a, had a big party, and he sent off uh, Hagar and Ishmael because Isaac was the son of promise. And then um, Abraham makes a covenant with um, Abimelech, the other, you know, the other king, and he's not going to do anything to him, and they're going to live at peace with each other. So, in chapter 22, after all of that stuff is passed, the Bible says in verse number 1 that God did tempt Abraham. Now, tempting, that, that word tempt literally just means like to test. Okay, people today, we, we have an idea of temptation. It's not like super far off of um, what the word tempt really means. But when we think of being tempted, we, we kind of think of you are enticed to do something that's wrong. But when you are already desiring to do something that's wrong, you've already sinned. So like, and I don't want to get too far into this because the definition really is just the word tempted. But think about this as a perfect example. Jesus Christ was without sin. He was sinless. So when it says that he was tempted of the devil... When the devil was telling him these things, he didn't secretly in his heart like really want to make that stone into bread. That was one of the temptations that, that he tempted him with, right? Because if he had this desire already, like if, if he was lusting after that, then that would already be sin. You know, that's not what the word tempt, I mean, tempt, it, it was, you know, you're confronted with something and it's a test. How are you going to deal with this? How are you going to respond, right? And Jesus, of course, when he was tested, came out with flying colors because he did everything absolutely right. So there's no sin there. There's not even the thought of him sing, sinning. He just did everything the way he's supposed to, but it was still a test. Satan was testing him. So we see here, God ends up testing Abraham. And really what he's doing is he ends up testing his faith. So let's see, um, let's keep reading here. It says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said, unto, and said unto him, Abraham. So he calls on Abraham and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. So the, the test is that He's, has, he's, he's telling Abraham to take his son to offer him for a burnt offering. Now, that's a pretty big test. That's a pretty big deal. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, this is, Abraham finally has the son of his promise, the son of his wife, Sarah, in their old age. You know, he's 100 years old, and, and God has this, you know, there's this great miracle. Isaac is born. You can imagine how much he loves his son. Sit up straight. You can imagine how much he loves his son and for God then to ask him now, okay, take your son, your only begotten son, the one that you love, and I want you to offer him for a burnt sacrifice unto God. So that's, this is a big deal. Now what we're going to see in this chapter, this chapter is amazing. There's so much biblical prophecy prophesying the, the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. We're going to look at all the symbolism and parallels tonight as we go through the story. It truly is amazing. I mean, this is, this is an, an enactment, essentially, of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And there's a lot of things that are referenced here that are symbolic. Now, um, before I get into all of that, I just want to point out real briefly here, verse number two, he tells him to take his son, Isaac, and get into the land of Moriah. 
And that Mariah is referenced one other time in the Bible. To keep your finger here, turn if you would to 2 Chronicles chapter number 3. And he tells them to offer, their, offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So he says, I want you to go into the land of Moriah. And there's, there's multiple mountains in the land of Moriah. And I'm going to tell you which mountain I want you to go to to sacrifice them on. Now, look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 3, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prayed in the threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite. So we see here, now we don't know for sure if Abraham brought Isaac to Mount Moriah, right? Because Mount Moriah is talking about one specific mountain in the land of Moriah, like that's called Mount Moriah. But we see that what I want to point out here is that Jerusalem is in Mount Moriah. So Jerusalem is in the land of Moriah, right? According to the Bible, we see that here. So this is just the first piece of evidence because where was Jesus Christ crucified? Where did he go? What city was he in? He was in Jerusalem, right? That's, if you remember, he was outside of the city of Jerusalem when he was making his entry and he cried over, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have, you know, when he's going in and um, in saying, you know, how often would I have, Covered thee and comforted thee, you know, as a as a as a chicken or as a you know as a hen. Um, man, I'm totally screwing up the the verse because I don't have it memorized. But um, how often he would have like taken care of her, or protected her, but she rejected him is basically what what he was saying in that verse. And um, he was outside of Jerusalem, and he was lamenting over Jerusalem, and that's where he was then when he when the judgment came down, and he ended up getting. Crucified, but um, so we see here that that Abraham is bringing Isaac to the same land, the same area. Um, and then what does he tell him? He says, "Take now thy son, thine only son." Right? You think about um, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he says, "Whom thou lovest, offer him therefore a burnt offering." Now. Abraham knew the gospel. And this is evidence in Galatians 3. You could turn there if you'd like, but in Galatians 3.8, we went over this just in the past few chapters already. Galatians 3.8 says in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, we know the gospel to be the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. People in the Old Testament knew that a Savior was coming. They knew when, uh, when Jesus Christ was, was talking to the woman at the well. She says, well, when Messiah cometh, you know, he knows all things. You know, he'll be able, they, they were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a Savior, right? So she was looking for, well, well when Messiah cometh, that's what she was saying to Jesus, right? Because they were expecting a Messiah to come. They were expecting a Christ to come. And how did they know that? They knew that through Old Testament scriptures. So Abraham even knew this. Galatians 3.8 evidences that he was preached before the gospel. Abraham knew the gospel. Now, he didn't know the name of Jesus Christ, but he, doesn't have to, he didn't have to know the name to know that God was going to send his son to die on the cross and, and be risen again from the dead to, um, to pay for the sins of the whole world. Because people have always been saved by grace through faith. It's never been by obedience to the law. It's always been through faith. And, um, and it was with Abraham as well. But we, we see here that he knew the gospel. He knew that God was going to send someone. And he knows that God is capable of resurrecting people even from the dead. Abraham also knew, because people will look at this story and they'll throw you for a loop and be like, whoa. And, and you know what the, the atheists will like to do? And people who hate God and want to ridicule and mock the Bible will do. They'll, they, they, they spin this story in a way like, like as if Abraham was some nutcase, you know, some crazy, insane person. Like, you know, you see sometimes the homeless people that are like talking to themselves and talking to nobody and, you know, that are probably possessed with devils and, and you know, just saying weird things. They'll be like, Oh yeah, so what about this guy or so, you know, some some psycho that kills his family members and said, "Oh, well God told me to do it." And they'll use stories like that and, and basically they try to make it sound like 
that was Abraham. That like, oh yeah, this crazy Abraham was going to go and kill his son because God told him to do it. You know, and, and this is an objection that people have and they'll, and they'll try to make the Bible, like anyone that believes in the Bible look foolish because they'll, they'll make it sound like that. But that is not the case at all here with Abraham. There's many reasons why we know that that's not the case in there, and you cannot make an analogy like that because it's ridiculous. Because of all the circumstances and events that surrounded this, we know that Abraham was, was preached the gospel. That's just one thing. But Abraham knew that God can't break his promises. He knew for a certainty that Isaac was the child of promise. Since he knew the gospel, he knew that God was able even to raise Isaac back up from the dead. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. It goes over lots of people in the Bible just historically that had great faith. And Abraham is a man who had great faith in the Lord. We're going to see some more evidence about, Ab about Abraham knowing in advance that he was not going to lose his son forever, that, he, that God was not telling him to murder his son and that he was just going to be dead. He knew more than that. Hebrews 11 verse 17 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, remember I told you tempting was being, is a trial, it's a, it's a testing. Well, that's exactly what this is referring to. When he was tried, when he was tested, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Look at this. Accounting that God, and so this Abraham was accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure. Now, so we see here it says that, that accounting God was able to raise him up from the dead. He already knew that God, excuse me, can you take her out, please? We already knew, Abraham already knew that God was able to resurrect his son. We knew that that was capable. He says, because of Hebrews eleven nineteen, account that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Look at the next part. It says, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now, um, Abraham, in a, what, it, what this is saying here, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham knew, he, like, essentially, Abraham's body was, was essentially already dead for as far as, like, producing more children. You know, no man, in, when they're 100 years old, is, is still having, having kids. You know what I mean? But, so Abraham's body was considered dead in that it wasn't going to be bringing forth any more life, yet it did. Because it was a miracle of God. The same thing with Sarah's womb, right? Her, her body was dead in a sense because she wasn't capable of having any more children. Her body was, was past that point in her life. But because of the miracle of God, God had already given him a child as from the dead. Since God was able to do that to begin with, it wasn't that, that much more of a leap for Abraham to think, well, well God's already given me this child when, I, when, when we're practically dead. God can easily raise my son back again from the dead. And he knew the gospel. And he knew that he accounted God able to raise him from the dead. So here's a lot of evidence showing, look, Abraham knew all this stuff. Um, look at verse number 11 of Hebrews 11. And this is just kind of proving what I was just saying. Hebrews 11, 11 says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. So there it's also clarifying in verse 12 that he was as good as dead. Right? So God brought life from the dead, essentially, just in the fact that Isaac was even born. So for him to, to be counted um, faithful to, to be able to raise him from the dead, we know that. And now let's go back to Genesis 22. Now you could say, well, wait a minute, a lot of this stuff you're looking at is from the New Testament, right? But how do we know that Abraham knew that? Well, look at verse number 5 of Genesis 22. The Bible says, and Abraham was in 100, oh, excuse me, I'm on 21, 22, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. 
and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again again to you. So we know that Abraham wasn't planning, even though God had already at this point told him, you have to go and offer your, your, your son as a burnt sacrifice. He told his servants, his men that came with him, he says, okay, you guys stay here. Me and the boy are going to go up. We're going to offer sacrifice and, and we're going to come back. He was already telling them that they were both going to be coming back. He knew that this was an enactment of the gospel, of Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't have to know exactly why God wanted him to do all of this stuff. But he was doing it by faith. And he knew. He knew God already made the prophecy. This is the assurance that we can have today in our own salvation. This is the assurance that I for sure have today in my salvation. Because God cannot break his promise. But God that cannot lie, you know, promised before the world began. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began in, in Titus. God can't lie. When he promises us eternal life, it's eternal. We can take that to the bank. We know that God's not going to take it away from us. He's not a thief. When he gives us a gift, he's gonna, it's ours forever. When he says it's forever. When Jesus Christ says, as my personal favorite verse, in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He says, I shall not come into condemnation. He says, I have everlasting life. Those promises are true. Abraham believed those promises just as much as we believe them today. He knew it to be true. So if God makes a promise unto Abraham about his son, and that he was going to be an heir, and he was going to have all his children as, you know, as a sand by the seashore, all this stuff, Abraham believed that. Abraham now he believed it. He knew it. He knew it. So when God tells him to do this stuff, is it still kind of hard maybe to do stuff you know, that we don't quite understand? Sure. But Abraham understood one thing for sure, and that God was capable of raising his son back even from the dead. And he had no doubts that God was able to do that. And so when he goes, this is, this is not the rantings of a demon-possessed you know, vagrant that's, that's thinking God is telling him to do, to do weird, wicked things. This is a complete, full understanding of the gospel. This is, this is God, and this is God literally who did, who did speak to Abraham. God did go and have a conversation with Abraham before the angels went and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. God did speak to Abraham. He knew God. And Abraham was an upright man. He wasn't just some, some crackhead, you know, homeless person. So that, that, that argument is ridiculous. Don't let anyone try to get you sp spun around on that. But um, let's look at some of the symbolism here now. And let's keep reading here. Verse number six says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. So, you know, that he was going to make a burnt offering, so he brings the wood. Think about that. If he's laying the wood on his son, how do you think he's laying it? He's probably laying it on his back to carry up the mountain to do that. And what did Jesus Christ do? He was, he was given to, to carry his own cross to Calvary. Right now, obviously, he wasn't able to completely accomplish that, but he started off carrying it. This is just symbolic um, of Jesus Christ, and there's a lot more like this, and it gets really cool when you look into it. Um, all, I mean, this is how perfect the Bible is, and in all these prophecies, how long before Jesus Christ, you know, appearing and, and fulfilling all this prophecy? I mean, that's like a couple thousand years. If you think about it, even just from the time it's written down. And these events happened before Moses wrote it down. Because the first five books of the Bible are, are the, the books of Moses, right? And Abraham and all these events happened prior to that even being written down. This, is, this happened quite a long time before. But all the details are here perfectly. Perfectly. It's amazing. Let's keep reading. Verse number seven. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So now his son, and again, sit down in your seat. He's asking for the lamb. And you know, I mentioned before, we don't know everything that Abraham knew back then and what they were supposed to do, but they knew they were supposed to offer a lamb sacrifice. Now, you think of the Passover lamb that happened with Moses, right? That happened um, when the, right before they were, they were sent out of Egypt was when they were told to kill the, the lamb and then put the blood on their doorposts, 
right? That and, that and that was the big major event of the Passover. And then after that, when God like gives Moses all of the law, they are, they are um, given the, the commands to continually do that, that feast of the Passover and to recognize that event because of what happened with Moses. But we see even prior to all of that, they're looking for a lamb. Specifically, they mentioned a lamb to sacrifice to God. They knew that this is what God wanted for his sacrifice. And again, Jesus Christ is that sacrificial lamb. So Isaac is even asking, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Where is it, right? Verse number eight, and, Ab and Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now, again, I mean, just showing even more proof that Abraham knew that this was an enactment of the gospel. Just by saying that God will provide himself a lamb. Because he knew one day God will present himself a lamb. God's going to give us a lamb that's without blemish, that's without spot, that's perfect, that's sinless. The Son of God to come and take away the sins of the world. That perfect lamb. And look at what he says. He's going to provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And this is one of those doctrines, I don't know why, it seems to be slipping by the wayside these days, where a lot of people don't even realize, they don't even understand that Jesus Christ, as the sacrificial lamb, was a burnt offering unto the Lord. In all senses. I mean, he was, when he was offered up to pay for the sins of the whole world, he took the, the sins of the whole world on his own body when he was on that cross. And when he died... The Bible says that his soul descended into hell and he remained in hell for three days and three nights before raising again from the dead. Acts chapter 2 says that clearly as well as Matthew chapter 12 when Jesus Christ himself said, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He knew where he was going and the reason why he was going there is to be that burnt sacrifice because for one, when we die in our sins, when we don't have a Savior, we go to hell to pay for our sins. That's the punishment. Well, if Jesus came to pay for the sins of the whole world, guess what he did? He took our sins and he paid for them in full. Not just, not alone with the shedding of his blood on the cross, but also with his dying, soul dying and going to hell, as is accounted for in Scripture. And as we even see right here, Abraham saying that God's going to provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Talking about a future event. Not talking about, um, you know, just this thing that we do every single year in, with the Passover lamb. No. He's talking about God providing himself an offering, a one-time offering. Not, well, God's going to make a law that's only going to be in effect for a little while, and we're going to have to have this lamb as a burnt offering year after year. And... You know, forget about the fact that the Bible specifically says when it talks about the, the Passover lamb sacrifice that it says, don't eat of it raw or sodden or don't, you know, don't boil it with water, but it has to be burned, it has to be burned. And whatever you don't eat that day, it need, the, the, all the rest of it just needs to be burned, all of it. Very, very specific. And I preach an entire sermon about this. But I don't understand what is so difficult for people to get about the concept that Jesus Christ was a burnt offering. And we see that here in Genesis 22. Look at ver in, uh, in verse 8 as we just read. So, I mean, Abraham knew what was going to happen. He knew what he was doing. He knew he was, he was showing what the gospel was. Um, so they go up the hill. Verse 8. Look at verse number 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there. And laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. So Abraham ties, you know, he gets all the wood, he builds an altar, he gets all the wood ready, ties up his son, he's getting ready to perform the sacrifice. It says in verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. So he's ready to do it, because he has full faith that God is able to, to, to raise him from the dead. Verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And so what happens? Abraham's tested. 
he passes. He was able to, he, he heard the word of the Lord. He didn't argue with God. He said, okay, I'll do it. He wasn't even, even though you could only imagine the love that he had for his son. But when God told him to do that, Abraham did exactly what God told him to do. And um, that requires a lot of faith to be able to do that. And, and Abraham was a great man of faith. But let's, uh, let's keep reading here. Look at verse number, number 13. It says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So, God had seen enough. He says, okay, you know, like, he's about to go through with this. You don't need to do it, Abraham. I can see your heart. I know you're going to do it, right? I know, I know now you're not even withholding your son from me. And um, talk about the amount of love, too, that, that Abraham would have. We, we, I use this illustration out soul winning um, to show how much God loves us. I'll give an example of, especially when people have children, it hits real home, but you don't have to have children to understand this concept. It's, it's pretty easy to understand. I tell people, you know, can you imagine giving up your child to pay for something that someone else did wrong? Say someone else that's not your family member, someone you don't even know, has gone and they commit a murder. They've done something real bad. They've stolen. They've committed murder. They've done, you know, they've, they've done things that they deserve a punishment for. They deserve to be put to death. But you decide, you know what? I love that person and I'm going to save them by exchanging my child for that person. And nobody can could, could comprehend that. There's no way would I give my, one of my daughters for, for, someone, for a murderer, right? But God did it. God did it for all of us. We were all as undeserving as the murderer is of going to heaven. We all deserve hell. God loved us so much, but God commended His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were sinners against Him, Christ died for us. The only begotten Son was given as a sacrifice for us. To pay for our sins. We don't deserve it, but he did it anyways. Now, that is tremendous love. But we see here Abraham willing to give up his son. Abraham loved God. Abraham is definitely a man you could say loved God because he obeyed his commandments. And, um, and he was willing to, to not withhold anything from God. But, um, but we see here in verse 13 that we just read. So, after he hears the angel tell him, okay, look, you know, like, like, don't, you know, you don't have to go through with this. He looks up and he sees a ram. Now the ram is caught in a thicket by his horn. So you think of like a bramble bush. He's in, he's in a thicket, right? And that is very symbolic of Jesus Christ having the crown of thorns on his head, right? Because the, the ram stuck in the horns in this, in this bramble bush, whatever it is. And I'm sure it's, 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 a thorn, you know, it's a thorny thing. It's a, this thicket. And Jesus Christ had the crown of thorns that was, that was put on his head. So more symbolism there of Jesus Christ. And then look at this. It says, Abraham went and took the ram. So he takes his ram. Now he offers the ram up in the stead of his son. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the substitute. And again, for another soul winning example that we use, you know, we often tell people that, well, I can't pay for your sins. Because I have my own sins to pay for, you know, any payment that I make is, is, is for my own. If I were to die and go to hell, that would be just and right because I have sins that I need to pay for. And because I have those sins, I can't say, well, I'll go to hell and pay the punishment for you because I already deserve it. The only way you would possibly be able, be able to an, accept a payment like that is if I didn't deserve that punishment at all because I was perfect. I was completely without sin. And I said, well, you know what? I don't deserve the punishment. I don't deserve hell at all, not one bit. But I will pay and put myself in your place to pay for that punishment. And that's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ was our substitute. He put himself in harm's way. He took on 
the sins of the world to pay that punishment so that we don't have to. Um, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 reads, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He was standing in our place. He is the payment for our sins. He is that sacrifice, as we see here, that ram that was, that was given as an offering in our stead, in our place. We deserve to be in that place. Jesus took that place for us. Let's keep reading here in Genesis chapter 22. Look at verse number 14. It says, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jiri, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So remember when we looked up that Mount Moriah? And it just, just more prophecy. He named that place Jehovah Jiri. And of course, Jehovah is the name of the Lord. Um, and it means... In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Jehovah Jiri. And that's, uh, that, that is exactly what happened. It, it, was, it, it was seen. It was seen when Jesus Christ came. He carried his cross up the mountain and was crucified and took on the sins of the whole world and, and the whole nine and everything that he fulfilled that we see from this chapter. It was seen there. Now, um, let's keep reading here. Verse number 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So, turn if you would, keep your finger here, turn if you would to James chapter 2. We just had our soul winning workshop um, number four on Sunday. And I, and I didn't go into this at all. But I, I'd mentioned that when you're talking to like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and other people for that matter, it's a good idea when, if you've been soloing for a little while and you're pretty good and you're, and, you're, and you're learning more stuff, make sure you're comfortable with James chapter 2 because this is a common place that people will go to to try to justify their belief in a works-based salvation. And of course, we know that works-based salvation is false, but I want to help you to get a better understanding of what James 2 is about because James 2 when, when they're trying to say that that you need you know faith without works is dead is referring to this story in Genesis this is what it's referring to of, of Abraham offering up his son Isaac okay now again I preach an entire sermon about about this James 2 topic where we look at Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 3, and other places to, to kind of prove all these different um, accounts of Abraham, right? And Abraham believing God and it being accounted unto him for righteousness. We've done that study before. But I just, as long as we're in Genesis chapter 22, this is what James 2 is talking about. So look at James chapter 2. Look at um, verse number 20. Because this is, this is where places will, uh, oh, you know what, let's start uh, reading verse number 19. Oh, verse number 18. I'm going to keep on going, going back. Oh, verse 17. Verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? So, you know, people will bring you to this portion of Scripture and try to tell you, see, look, the devils believe, but that's not enough because faith without works is dead. 
But what's stupid about that way of thinking is a, is a lot of things. But for one, it says the devils believe that there's one God. Now, the believing in one God does not save you. Just believing the fact that there is one God. Look, Jehovah's Witnesses believe there's one God. That doesn't mean they're saved today. Islam. Muslims believe there's one God. That doesn't mean they're saved today. The devils believe that there's one God, but that doesn't mean that they're saved. And for another thing, devils... Who even says, what are the rules that apply to devils for salvation? We know that for human beings that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know what God has laid out or if he's laid out anything for angels because devils are just fallen angels to get saved. The Bible doesn't record anything about that because they're ministering spirits. So, you know, try not to get too caught up in their arguments. But I want you to understand because this can be confusing. You say, well, wait a minute. Because we'll look at what it says in the next verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? So they're saying, well, see, wasn't, wasn't Abraham uh, uh, justified by works? And if you get these, if these people are getting into your head, you're looking at this all wrong. You're starting to think like, well, that's what it says. Abraham was justified by works. So how can it just be by faith alone if, if Abraham was justified by works? That's why it's always good to compare Scripture with Scripture and look at Romans chapter 4 that says, but to him, you know, um, that Abraham, for if, um, well, my mind is going blank. For if righteousness were of the law, Abraham hath were of the glory, but, um, but not before, was it Abraham? What shall we say then? Abraham his father, as pertaining to flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. Romans 4 says that. If he were justified by his works, then he could glory about it. But he can't before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now what we have to understand, first of all, is that this is not, James 2 is not talking about eternal salvation at all. And I'll make that clear in just a minute when we, when we read a little bit further. But what we're seeing here is that in there is a way that Abraham was justified by works. Because that is what the Bible says. Was not Abraham justified by works? Yes. The key is, in what way? How was he justified? Was he justified for his soul to receive eternal life? If that were the case, again, that's pretty stupid. You, 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 so that means, you mean to tell me that if this is talking about his eternal salvation, Abraham was well over 100 years old before he finally got saved. Right? After all the things we've seen Abraham do, after all the things in Hebrews 11 where it says he, you know, that he had all this faith prior to all of this event, other things that he did showed that he had faith. Yet, now you're going to say that his soul was justified in the sense that he, is, he, he has received eternal life at this point in his life and he never did before that? It's, it's ridiculous. But... Um, but let's keep reading. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So again, verse 24 says, you see how? How is a man justified by faith, or I mean, with, with works and faith? How is it? Well, we see how he was justified because first he believed God, but then it says the scripture was fulfilled. Now, how was the scripture fulfilled? Well, the promise was, had already been made to him that God was going to multiply his seed, right? But then when, when he tells Abraham to offer up his son and he says because you've done this thing because you've obeyed my voice in blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. he says now I'm going to reward you now I'm going to bless you and multiply you and and it's like a confirmation of that promise because of what Abraham did it's it's this this um this, this extra confirmation that he says um, 
in fulfilling that scripture which said, James 2.23, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. And what Abraham believed God about was Isaac was the blessing, was the, um, well, and it says, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed in Galatians chapter 3. And that's what, um, that was the gospel that was preached on him. That's what he believed. And again, if you think of Galatians chapter 3, it refers to that as being the gospel. So in, uh, Galatians 3, 8, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, if that was the gospel, and it was preached unto Abraham, and Abraham believed that, and the New Testament says over and over again, what we have to do to be saved is believe the gospel. Right? People are sent to preach the gospel. They're sent to preach the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Abraham was preached the gospel and he believed it. Abraham was saved. This being justified by his works was not his eternal salvation. This justification, this um, what Abraham received as a result of his works was a blessing was rewards. And that's exactly what we receive if we are faithful, if we will do works for God, God will reward us. And God rewarded Abraham openly and blessed him tremendously by making his sand as the, the sea which is by the seashore, as a, you know, um, as the sand which is by the seashore, his seed. This is not talking about Abraham's eternal salvation. But it's interesting, though, that we see this story and, and him going through all this stuff and God seeing his faith because that's also the point where, where you know, kind of the, the rubber hits the road with your faith. You know, you could say you believe something, you know, and he honestly did believe it. And he believed it so much that he went and, and acted upon it, right? And he, he showed his faith. He showed his faith openly that he honestly believed in his heart that God was able to raise him up from the dead because he was willing to even sacrifice his own son because he knew that God was able to do it. So that's the faith that he had. And, it's, and there it says, and even in James 2, that his faith was made perfect, right? In, in, in showing it out. And, you know, this is something that I even struggle, and I, I think a lot of people probably have in their own life. I knew, you know, I was saved when I was 20 years old because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that faith wasn't always outwardly manifested, to other people because guess what I didn't have works for a long time my faith was dead but does that mean that because my faith was dead that God removed my eternal salvation or somehow eternal life was no longer eternal at that point for that period of time in my life no it's it eternal means forever it means it never ends that's what eternal means e means not and turn is like termination it, it doesn't end eternal means it never ends so if I have eternal, if I received eternal life when I was 20, just because I wasn't doing works and my faith died doesn't mean that eternal life ended. The Bible never says that. Now, when my faith is alive and I'm doing good works, I can be justified in my works wrought with my faith. But it's not for my eternal salvation. It's a different type of justification. It's going to be justification through the eyes of other people. They're going to be able to look upon and actually see my faith in action and know that I have faith based on how I'm, I'm living my life. Because I remember there's times when after I was saved but I was doing nothing for God, I started to think like, why do I keep doing these sins? Why am I doing this so much? If I believe the Bible, which I did, I, but I'm questioning myself at this point saying, well, if I truly believe this, why would I be doing these things? It's a good question. And if, and if you, you know, if you're not right with God, if you're, you're in, you know, wrapped up in all kinds of a sins, ask yourself the same question. Or any time you, you, know, you have a habitual sin or something like that, or something you have a hard time shaking, you're just thinking like, well, wait, do I really believe this or not? You know, hopefully the answer is you do. I, I did. I honestly believed it, but it came to a point where I had to question myself. Because I was so steeped in sin. And I knew that the Bible was, was preaching against all that stuff and taught against that. So, um, 
outwardly to anyone else, I was a hypocrite, if anything. If I was able ever to say that, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Oh, you believe in you believe the Bible? You believe the Bible is the word of God? You believe that to be true? Then what are you doing every night hanging out at the bar? And they'd be right in saying that. Now, does that mean I didn't believe? No. You can't see my heart. You don't know what I believe. I know I believed. But as far as being justified in the men of in, in the eyes of men and in, in, in front of anyone else, pff, I wasn't justified at all. Now I can be in it, you know, in, in many areas that, that I've, you know, God's given me a victory over a lot of sin in my life. But um, back then, no way. And this is more what James 2 is talking about. And that's why it says, you know, if if someone's hungry, you know, what's good is it going to do for, uh, for them if you just say, okay, yeah, be filled. Or if they're naked, like, okay, yeah, be clothed. And you don't do anything for them. It doesn't do them any good. It doesn't change the status of your heart or the status of your eternal salvation, whether you help that person or not. But it's not going to do anyone else any good. And um, it's those works wrought with our faith brings that justification through the eyes of others. And that's how that Abraham was justified, not just by um, his faith, but also through his works. Let's finish up this chapter. Go back to Genesis chapter 22. We're going we're gonna to wrap up the rest of this chapter. It says in verse 19, So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor, Huz his firstborn, and Buzz his brother, and Kemuel the father of Aram, and Kezad, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Ruma, she bare also Teba and Gaham and Thehash and Maacha. And, um, you know, there's really, I couldn't find a whole lot of significance with these people that are being born here other than the fact that it gives you, like, where Rebecca's from. Because we're going to see in the next few chapters that Isaac ends up marrying Rebecca, and Rebecca is, is of the same family, essentially. It's Abraham's brother, has children. And then um, his child bears Rebecca, right? So that would be yeah, they'd be like second cousins because that's it would be Abraham and Rebecca. It would be like his her great uncle, and then um, yeah, they uh, Rebecca and Isaac would be like second cousins. I think I'm not that great with the with the terminology on the on the on the family tree, but I think that's why that's why we're seeing this here, because we're going to be introduced then to Rebecca real soon. So um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this book of the Bible. We thank you for the prophecies and for our Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross and paying for our sins, dear Lord. We thank you for giving us such an awe-inspiring word that was compiled over so many years and is just completely perfect and goes way above and beyond the workings that any man or group of men can do in their own strength and in their own power dear lord we know that this that you are the author of this book and um the prophecies the, the sheer number of prophecies and, and everything that you've written here is just truly amazing, dear Lord. And um, what's amazing to me is that we're not even grasping at straws and trying to apply something that was written to be a prophecy like people do with Nostradamus and these, these other um, false prophets, dear Lord. But we can look at a chapter that very clearly, very clearly is being symbolic and very clearly is talking about a sacrifice and we can see all of the, the details that you've included that line up completely perfectly with what happened with Jesus Christ, dear Lord. And we thank you that we don't, we don't have to be um, doubtful in our faith. 
but that we can trust you completely. We know that you're not a liar, dear Lord, and we could stand firm. And um, I pray that you would please help us all to have a, a, a good understanding and increased knowledge of some of the verses that might seem to be a little bit difficult for us to grasp simply because people, devils have come in and, and tried to bring in their damnable heresies and have maybe confused or, or twisted our minds or our understandings a little bit regarding what the true meaning is of these scriptures, dear Lord. But help us just to... Um, to be able to combat that with the truth by you giving us more knowledge, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.